Okay. All right, let's go three, two, and one. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Persuasion by the Pint. I'm Jonathan Taylor, along with... Sean McCool. You know, I knew you were going to do that intro, and you know how I knew? How's that? It's national. It's International Psychic Week this week. <laughs> wow. Uh, August 7th through the 13th is International Psychic Week. So I, I just wow. had a feeling that's that's what you were going to come out with. So, yeah. Just had to tie that in, right? Just had to tie that in. I mean, I'm looking at the calendar of, of days today to see if there was anything exciting as we're recording this. Yeah. Um, we uh, missed a huge one last week, huge opportunity last week. I know. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were on the road and you know, but Hey, but you know what today is today is world elephant day. Oh, okay. I mean, I don't know how we're going to tie that in, but, (laughs) or maybe if you're, are you into vinyl like records and stuff? Uh, no, you're you're still a cassette guy. Yeah, well, yeah, cassettes, uh, maybe eight tracks. Um, no, I would, you know, I've got this, I've got this feeling. I would love to be in a, a vinyl, go back to some of those oldies and yeah. pull some of those vinyls because I hear the qualities. Uh, well, it's just different, right? You get a little more, yeah, of that analog e- essence to it, a little static, yeah. just enough yeah. little static and kind of reverb going on. I mm-hmm. think, but yeah, today's vinyl record day as well for all those vinyl record lovers. Oh, okay. At least as we're recording, so my father, my father-in-law has a huge collection of uh, old vinyl records. Yeah. So uh, he would he would be the one to uh, talk to. I, he's probably not looked at them in years, but he yeah. keeps them around. They're probably worth. My son is into vinyl. He's been into really? vinyl for probably ten years. Yeah. Since wow. He was probably sixteen. He's very cool. That was kind of his generation, though. They they were bringing back vinyl. Sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of bringing things back, what are we bringing back to the show today? Since I kind of threw you <laughs> off track there, <laughs> what are we bringing back? It's kind we of an oldie. Going to, yeah, we're going to bring some. Uh, we're going to bring some good beer. We're going to bring some good topics today on our flight. We're going to yeah. be talking a little bit of um, some takeaway uh, today. Yeah, so we've got a number of things. We're going to talk about some uh, principles of marketing and some lessons from Alfred Hitchcock um, that I've going to be sharing. I've got a biography on him and I find there's some interesting things on how he went about marketing. He was a brilliant marketer um, and made a fortune promoting his movies. Specifically, I think he's most known for, he's, I mean, a lot of these crazy, some of the, like the birds and uh, yeah. some of these others, but Psycho was the one that I think he grossed, I think he made like 15, what is it, about 15 million off of that alone, which back then was quite a quite a nice sum of money um you know i don't know what that is equal to in today's dollars who knows well, i thought it was interesting that you you kind of picked that title because last weekend uh, i was flipping through the channels and on one of the showtime or hbo channels mm-hmm. it was like alfred hitchcock all day like all really? his movies so i don't know if it was like that's what hmm. I was actually on the calendar for it was like alfred hitchcock's birthday last week or something and i missed <laughs> it or yeah like um, so I don't know, hmm. maybe that's what was going on. I never looked it up. Yeah. I saw that title today in the studio. So, yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. quite the showman. Yeah. yeah. Quite the showman. So and I've got a couple of little things. Um, if we get to them, um, I was hired this week to write a couple of advertorials. Mm-hmm. So we can talk about storytelling and very story-based advertorials too. Right. So those were fun to write. Um, I'm like, man, I should just do that all the time. It's like whenever I get a new project that's fun, I'm like, ooh, that's what I should do all with the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm I'm anxious to hear about these. Yeah. So um, I can't share the ones I wrote because yeah. they're not out yet. Um, mm-hmm. But I can share. I pulled a couple. I pulled a, an example. Um, mm-hmm that we can look at that's that I know is doing pretty well. So awesome. So, yeah. So, uh, before we get to that, I guess we've got some beverages. You were, you, uh, you went and grabbed something while you were on the road this week. Yeah. I had a meeting yesterday over in, um, uh, Crossville, Tennessee. And, um, 
which is about an hour away. It's hour west. It's kind of in between Knoxville and Nashville. Um, it's a great place. A lot of people come there. Uh, a lot of people retire to Crossville. A lot of people mm -hmm. don't know about that. They, uh, it's a great retirement place. In fact, <laughs> there's mostly a bunch of retirees uh, were in there yesterday when I visited this little uh, brewery out in the middle of nowhere. But um, it's a little place over in Sparta. I guess you'd call it Sparta, Tennessee. It's kind of close between uh, Crossville and Cookville. And um, really off the beaten path. It's not like it's in like the like the downtown area or like it's not. It, you would think this place would be like in the downtown area. A lot of people coming. But this is a, off a beaten road a lot in of the these middle micro, of nowhere. A lot of these micro breweries are because I guess that's probably where real estate's the cheapest you know, warehouse yeah. space. I don't know if there's a zoning issue, you know, if you want to have actual yeah. pots and all that kind of stuff, maybe there's a zoning issue too. Um, but yeah, having a lot of the ones around here like that, they're out in the, off some farm to market road. Yeah. Oh, well, that's the way this was, it was nothing but farmland around. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I could, it, it was even hard to find a lot of people. And I, I was like, I pulled in like around two, maybe two o'clock and there's like a lot of people were already there parked. The seating was outside. There's very little seating inside. A couple, a couple of small places, then right up around the bar area. Yep. But uh, I stopped there for about like 45 minutes or so just to have uh, one that I really like, which is the one that you have right there in front of us, Dead Horse, the Calf Killer Dead Horse. Yes, yeah, so the name of this place is Calf Killer. Yep. Brewing, Calf Killer. Right? Yep. Yeah. So I decided, you know, I had one and like before I left, I said, you know what? They had the growler. So I've decided to pick up a growler of, oh, yeah. uh, of calf killer. It's like, well, I'll get one of those to go. So uh, I'm excited because this one's really good. It's a porter and uh, I don't even have the information pulled up. There you go. Uh, an oatmeal brown sugar entire precursor. What is that? Traditionally traditionally untraditional an oatmeal and brown sugar entire okay yeah whatever cursor to the porter no, i don't know what that means uh this beer is well balanced dry faintly roasted slightly chocolatey moderately warm and heavily drinkable um, such fancy words for beer yeah sugar entire i don't <laughs> I, I don't i don't know who wrote that but <laughs> Yeah, I don't you know, like odd. To, might have to look that up and see what that means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't yeah, so. didn't 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 write it for us uh yeah. us common folks here, but six six percent ABV, so nice yeah. dark porter. So that, that mm -hmm. should be good. Yep. Well, I I am going a little bit off the beer path today. Ooh. Um I found these a couple weeks ago and been saving them. I have, I've had, I have had one, not today. It sounds like it, but not today mm -hmm. yep. previously, but I'm going with the espresso shot spiked cold brew. Okay. This Whoa, is a wow. perfectly blended espresso brew made from premium dark roast Arabica coffee, mm -hmm. real dairy cr cream and natural flavor sweetened with agave and sugar comes in at 12.5%. So this is one of those new category of um, pre-mixed cocktails that you've been seeing a lot of. Right. Now it's in the coffee genre. Yeah. Now they've, we've got coffee spiked coffee basically. So that it's called spiked cold brew. Mm -hmm. You can see that there it is. Yeah. Um, little bitty tiny can. So it's, it's, you know, it comes, it's a cocktail size glass. Mm -hmm. It's not a pint. I mean, you could just pour two of them. Did I see 12 and a half percent? Yeah, twelve and a half percent. Okay, so um, probably don't want to do a pint of it. At least not in not in one show. So <laughs> I thought these would be fun, and uh, I did. Oh, well, I'll give my review here in a second when we when we toast it up. So okay. So yeah, let's toast it up. All right. I already know what to uh, get in mind. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh. Mm. So I'll tell you what this tastes like. If you've ever had coffee and Bailey's, mm -hmm. that's pretty much what Bailey's Irish like. cream. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's not as quite as minty, but it's got that same kind of feel to it. Mm -hmm. It's just pre-mixed for you. So it's, um, I'm going to give, I'm going to give this a 4.5. 4.5. Oh, wow. That's, 
It's, it's good. Really good. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 just, so I mean, no fuss. Where can I just, find these? Where I mean, where do where these do were you, the grocery uh, store? So um, okay. if you go on their site, they're actually sold out. Okay. But they do have a place on the site that says shop. I think. So you got these at what eight? It was H-E-B, H-E-B here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I want to see if I can find um, this vanilla cinnamon. That sounds really good. Mm. But they have just a regular coffee mocha. Ooh. This one is espresso shot, mm-hmm. salted caramel, and a vanilla cinnamon. I'm I'm going to see if I can find the vanilla cinnamon this, this weekend. Um, but yeah, I got them at H-E-B. But I saw somewhere on here where you could shop and find them. But you can buy them on the website, but they're all sold out. Mm-hmm. So I don't know where else to. I don't it looks see amazing. A, yeah, I don't see a store finder, so I'm not sure mm-hmm. where to find how to find out where you sell them. But um, I would think if you just look up spiked cold brew, maybe Total Wine would have them as well. So yeah, it's really good. So, oh yeah, I got to find those. That sounds really, really good. Yeah, I was a little nervous, like. What time of day do I drink this? Because it's you know it's spiked at twelve and a half percent. It's not a, it's not a small right right. It's not a four percent you know Starbucks nitro brew. Mm-hmm. So I was like, but if I drink it too late, it's got espresso in it. Like I don't I don't know when to drink it. So I think this is a happy hour <laughs> drink. You know because you got to get it early enough that the caffeine doesn't keep you up and late enough. Right right. You know that you're not totally buzzed during the middle of your workday. So oh wow man. Tough, tough choices in it that we have in our in our lives. I know, I know. Man, these are first world problems right here. Absolutely, so. uh, that's on my list. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be looking for those next week. Yeah, I'll send you a link so you can remember because I know you won't remember by the end of the show. So no. <laughs> <laughs> not after All right, this well, growler, man. I'm telling you, that's a. It's a at least it's only six percent, not a ten yeah, percent porter or something. Yeah. So you'll be good. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give uh, my rating on this is I'm going to give this one a four seven. Uh, very good, nice, uh, very good. I will Enjoy have to stop this. there on the next trip east, whenever that the, is. Um, when I walked in yesterday, she she's like, "Come on up," and she's like, she gave me samples of everything they had, um, and uh, you know, just little small small samples, and this one was by far the best. Um, yeah. You know, everything, there was nothing really bad, but this was by far the best. And I said, that's what I want. Yeah. And, uh, so give me a growl. Well, some of their, some of their <laughs> names, like the wizard sauce. Yeah. No, the scorned the hooker. Scorned hooker. <laughs> yep. Yep. The classic stout. Okay. Mm-hmm. Ye old calf killer quasi. Yeah. The brown recluse. Yeah. It's a spider for those of you that don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, the scorched hooker. Is that on there twice? Uh, the scorned yeah. hooker. Oh, they're scorned, scorned, and, and scorched, and scorched. Two very different hooks, <laughs> by the way. The golden calf, nice yep. little biblical uh, yep. allusion yep. there. The trail yep. ale, dark earth, mm-hmm. cer- cerebral. Predator. I had that one yesterday. The cere- cerebral predator. Um, yeah. That one is yeah. That's a little higher. It's seven point two percent. It's hoppy. It says the most. It was very hoppy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, October surprise, a special kind of evil. Yep. Seems like they got a little bit of a dark side going on here. They do. Yeah. So, um, did that show up in the decor at all? Or was uh, it- a little, a little bit. It, I mean, it was, um, you know, it, it was just like kind of an old farm. It kind of reminded me the way everything was hung. It was kind of a, maybe a, a dark version of Cracker Barrel <laughs> with stuff all over the wall. You know, you walk in a Cracker Barrel it? and they have the, those old signs and things like that. But uh, yeah, it's it's a cool location though. Um, they uh, they have a little outside area to sit and drink and tables outside. You know, not many sitting areas inside. So yeah, um, I think it'd be a great place during the fall season to uh, spend some time out. They got a fire pit out there, um, so I'm sure. From everything that I've heard, it's, you know, I talked to a people, a few local or a few people that were in there yesterday, and some of them were from uh, Florida and up visiting the area and then Pennsylvania, Ohio. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's very cool. Yeah. They've got a reputation in the area, I guess. Yeah. It's very cool. All right. Well, let's jump in. I want to also hear about um, the Rubik's Cube update. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. We didn't get to do that last week. So give us a little update on what's going on there and then we'll jump into the other, our flight of other topics. So I got a, um, um, episodes back or several episodes back, we talked about the sales letter and I wish I had pulled it. I should have remembered to pull it up in front of me, but the sales letter I sent to <laughs> a very large company with a Rubik's cube and, uh, uh, you know, it's it, you know, like anything, things take time. You get mm -hmm. their attention, you move from one step, but the, the, the main thing, the purpose of a sales letter is get you in the door and, right. you know, it's not to completely sell uh, everything, especially in a high ticket item. It's not going to sell you, but it's going to give you the opportunity to move to the next level. And so, um, so yeah, but big, the update currently is that, uh, this company has put in a order for, um, you know, for the, they put in their first order and, uh, which is, uh, potential to be a huge, uh, a significant, um, annual purchase order of about a half million dollars. So, um, ah, you should give yourself some applause for that. One. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's see. Yes. Yes. Well done. Well done. Um, and again, I, I go back to the, I have to give credit where credit's due. Um, you know, this was an idea I got from the ultimate sales machine, Chad Holmes, with, mm -hmm. I even pulled the headline uh, straight from the ultimate sh sales machine because he used a Rubik's Cube. And I think that the headline is there's, and I forget how many millions of uh, possible uh, oh, combinations, uh, combinations okay. for this Rubik's Cube, but there's only, uh, but there's only three that are important for your business in you know, be becoming a blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know for word for word, but um, I pretty much wrote it from, I took the headline and the sub headline from the Chet Holmes, reworked it just a little, probably kept the, um, I think kept the headline exactly the same, but then just used a lot of my own data and a lot of the own stuff to um, back up that headline and sub headline and, and put it in there and just, right wrote it out two pages and then put some testimonials in there. And it was, it was a, it was a winner. So let that be a lesson kids. You don't have to reinvent. You can just steal. <laughs> for the That's right. Part. That's right. Great art of steal. Great so, art of steal. <clears throat> um, and no, so yeah. I'm going to use that as a format, um, uh, you know, for, for future letters. I mean, it's, it was a winner. So it was kind of a test letter before I start making these and, I've got other industries that I'm targeting with these type of letters with the Rubik's cube. Um, I'm also doing some other lumpy stuff and I'm going to test like what's, what's getting the best response. Right. Um, I also got some, uh, I know you've mentioned the past using, uh, dice, you know, yeah. don't roll the dice. And so yes. I'm actually ordered some little packets of dice that I'm using for, uh, some lumpy, you know, lumpy mail campaigns for, mm -hmm. Uh, large customers, large clients, potential clients. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what, you know, what pulls the best. Yeah. And you love having stuff like when you do stuff like that, I think it's cool to, to have stuff. that's like, like some of the, the knickknacks that, that are used in lumpy mail are kind of cheesy and yes, you just want to throw them out. They're not great. Yep. So if you can think of something that's worth holding on to paradise, you can throw in a drawer you're probably not going to throw them away though. If they're actual dice, you know, it's just, you kind of want to, it just feels wrong to throw them away. Right. Same with the Rubik's cube, but mm -hmm. you know, some of this other stuff, now some of them are cool. Like the trash can one where you ball up the letter and put it in the trash right. can and you mail the whole trash can, um, the bank bag, those eventually get thrown away, but right. all those little things. <clears throat> but yeah, if you can think of something that people would want to hang on to and kind of keep as a knickknack on their office desk or share or shelf, Mm -hmm. Things pretty cool. Yeah, it is. And I found the letter. So it says, here's the title. The Rub this Rubik's Cube has more than 4 billion possible combinations, dot, dot, dot. And then subheadline is, fortunately, there are only three that you need to worry about when it comes to deciding on a reliable, reliable and then I give the chemical product uh, as that supplier for that yeah. product. And there then the three, the three things... Um, so obviously you come down if you have three th and I would say, keep it simple. Always, you know, go with three things. Cause it's very simple and concise. 
and I did obviously cost savings, reliability, and peace of mind. Peace of mind is a big one. And yeah. you will notice I've kind of used that as a ongoing pattern, which is huge um, for a lot of uh, the people that I work with or in the industries that I deal with. Peace of mind are huge. Reliability is huge. Uh, reliable supply. The stuff you're selling is fairly commoditized, right? It is. It is. Yeah, but the so. process by which you deliver it and the process by which you, the tech. It, it, so yeah, it is a commoditized, um, it is a commoditized product, but when you can add, the way you add value is using a system by which you deliver that yes. and a technology by which you help them not have to worry about running out, but there is mm -hmm. there is a technology in place that you attach to that which usually a lot of other, most of the other companies that I compete against do not offer that, or they make the customer provide it themselves or they make them buy it or something like that. You know, to yeah. me, it's like a package deal where you like, you know, we implement that. So you don't have to worry about it. And then they've got all the technology, um, to make sure that they never run low. They've got the alarm systems, the data and everything goes to their laptops, their smartphones, you name it. It's just a complete system that eliminates any type of worry of ever running out in their plant and uh, that can cause, and that's, that's the fear. It, it's not, you know, cost, who cares about the cost savings? Um, if you run out, it's going to cost you a fortune, your plant, right? no plant can afford to be down for three or four hours. It's, it's costing them millions and it's also costing jobs. You know, people can get fired over this stuff. You know, production yeah. manager can get fired if their plant comes to a halt for four or five hours. Um, you know, they have to answer questions when things like that happens. And so they want peace of mind. If you eliminate fear and I always remember Dan Kennedy always said, he's just, it doesn't matter who you're selling to. It, it, you're not selling to a company. You're selling to a person. You're yeah. selling to, if you're selling to, um, you know, the key to, to, the key to any sales is to know that you're selling to a person. You're not selling to a company. So always think about like, if you're selling, even in B2B, always know who you're selling to. If it's the purchasing agent, that's a person that is worried about something in their life happening or in their job happening that can change their life, like them getting fired or getting let go or, yeah. um, and, and there's a plant manager in that if you're selling to, that's worried about something hanging over his head that can cost him his job. Yeah, and, or, and that's the real reason this, that it's so hard to get people to switch suppliers. Yeah, exactly. Because until a major problem comes up, they'd rather just stick with what they know than exactly risk. I mean, that's really what, you know, the same reason people stick with the same detergent brand for 30 years, because that's right. there's a, there's a comfort in knowing. So if you're going to break that, you've really got to do something to break that. Right. And that's the main thing you're breaking is like, is this going to work for me when, I mean, I love this thing, but it works enough. Yeah. So Yeah. You yeah. Know, you, you, and you find out what you have to ask questions is what do you, what keeps you up at night? Like what keeps you up at night? What's, what's the biggest worry and identifying that, you know, running out of material or not having people in place that are reliable enough because a lot of, you know, you have a lot of, um, turnover in companies nowadays, you know, people come and go. And so yeah. you bring somebody in and they forget to check tanks or stuff like that. And your plant, you know, you rely on somebody that is not reliable or, or yeah. you know, that's new to the business and they may forget something and all it takes is one time and it's, it's costing you a lot of money and that, or yeah, or, you know, Chad, the check, the tank checker is yeah. at a dental appointment that morning and he's not there. Yeah. Not there. He, you know, that's and, right. And whoever he told me he's going to be out forgot because that's not mm -hmm. their regular job. Yep. Yeah. Little things like that. And that's, that's usually when stuff like that happens. It's mm -hmm. like that little oversight when one person's out or on vacation or running an errand or an emergency pops up over here. Right. So to automate that is, is really cool. So yeah, that's, that's cool. That's a great update and congratulations on that. That's a, uh, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. It's now a, exciting. I get to roll that out to your other 99 top prospects. That's right. That's right. It's called rinse and repeat. You change yes. a few things <laughs> then you yeah. rinse and repeat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a great, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a testimony to the fact that direct mail 
everybody talks about email, social media, all this stuff. And, you know, direct mail still works. It yep. still works huge. I mean, it's, it's a, it's one of the most important things you can do in your business and sure. a, a tailored approach, especially to a large, um, you know, company, uh, in B2B, or if it's a large, um, you know, a huge product that you're selling, um, where there's a lot of, uh, in my, in, you know, in my case, there's a lot of repeat sales onto that. And once you get the business, it's like rent, you know, it just keeps going and going residual it's residual income. So, um, yeah, I think, I think more internet marketers and, and guys like that should be selling their back end products by definitely. direct mail. Absolutely. And yeah. nobody is. Cause I don't, I don't get, I don't get messages from anybody, you know, I bought a no. lot of stuff and I don't, I don't get, you know, in pr there's a few people that I, that still do that. And they're, mm -hmm. but they're more like diet. They were, they started as copywriters and now they're in the info product business. Right. They'll still do it. There's one guy I'm thinking of that he actually still does it, but that's mm -hmm. it. In the past five years, I've probably gotten letters from one, maybe two people. Yeah. Out of dozens that, you know, I've bought mm -hmm. and I would probably probably be a good back end prospect for them. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're missing. So, I mean, that's a, it's crazy. Just missing free money out there. It's just forget about it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause that letter, even if they don't buy right away, will sit on their desk for weeks it will. or months yeah. sometimes, you know, Yep. or, is it, you know, eventually you close your browser tabs, you know, mm -hmm. you got to reboot or something. That's right. And then you lose the sales page. Yep. So, all right. Well, let's move on. What else? Um, what else were you going to, Bring up so, yeah, I wanted to mention, because I thought this is so interesting and it's a good takeaway to um, to anybody marketing their business. So I've been reading some uh, some stuff on Alfred Hitchcock lately. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of his one of the highest grossing movies that he ever produced was Psycho, you know. Um, so I think in the I think he made like 15 I think he made 15 million off of that movie alone um, back in the day. But a lot of people don't know that he was a brilliant, he, he produced these movies or directed them, uh, but they don't know that he was actually one of the biggest reasons that they were successful was just his marketing alone. Um, one of the things that he did to, yes, there he is, Alfred Hitchcock. So one of the things I found it interesting with his uh, his movie Psycho, I'm trying to put Sean. Do you have a? Can you pull up a movie poster of Psycho? Um, if you can find that, I should have I've, I should have been more prepared. But I'll tell you, one of the things that he did was um, I thought it fascinating. Yeah, there's it. <laughs> one of the oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things he did was uh, he would have manuals printed up. These were health like manuals to refer to in case of a um, in case somebody was to suffer from a heart attack <laughs> during the movie. Yeah, and he would actually have these printed up. These were actual manuals to be printed up and given out to all of the attendants at the you know at the showing. Look how many um, different movie posters there are for Psycho. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah, there's quite a few. I mean, that's probably the best depiction, in my opinion, of it. That's kind of the main characters and all that, other than Mother. So he created a real manual for the audience, warning them of possible health issues from watching the film. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that's interesting you should say that, because I was going through... Dan Kennedy's seven figure income. It's basically about how to move from six to seven figures and what's required. And one of yeah. the things he talks about in there is he talks about being over the top and outrageous and a little, you know, a little, little crazy. Um, and that's a great example. Like, you know, you got to take it a little, little further than most people are willing to take it. And yeah. I think, I think that's a, that's a great I could see that. Well, he was in the business that as a, on, on a prehead for a sales letter or an ebook, oh, yeah. like yeah. warning, reading this ebook, blah 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 blah. Yeah. Well, it's like he talks about, and I think I've I've listened to some of that seven, the one that you're referring to, mm -hmm. and all of these big, 
uh, these ultra, you know, these these guys that are bigger than life. You know, you think of David Ogilvy. Yep. Um, Gary Halbert, you know, in copywriting. Yep. Gary Halbert was in the Gary Halbert business. Uh, <laughs> David Ogilvy was in the David Ogilvy business. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and he referenced in there, he's like, you know, and it says this in the, you know, the Ogilvy books, but yeah. David Ogilvy used to come into the office with a cape. With a cape, yes. <laughs> like a full cape and a, you know, tweed yeah. dress outfit and, right. you know, with a splash of color in it when everybody else was wearing gray flannel. Mm-hmm. I mean, that kind of stuff, that's... Oh, yeah. You know, and our, our friend, um, Tim Davis, you know, he, yes. he goes around the country teaching this, like how to be a personality and have that brand oh, yeah. personality and having that, you know, costume slash uniform That's right. that you become known in your area, you know, yes. think about the Matthew Les- Lesko um, Riddler suit that he wore, you know, with the, mm-hmm. with the dollar bill suit. That's right. That's right. All those kind of things. And, you know, it's, it's crazy. Um, have we talked about the Savannah bananas on here on this show? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. See, that's another one that's just crazy over the top. We'll, we'll have to do a, a show on that next week. Cause that's a, that's an easy thing oh, yeah. to do. Huh? So, um, so yeah, I love it. I love the over the top topness. I, that's hard for me personally as an extrovert to pull that off. So I've, I've often wondered like how you might pull that off as an extrovert. Do you just do it in, in copy like Alfred yeah. Hitchcock did, you know? Right where you just kind of write some stuff about it. That's because it's hard for me to be that big flamboyant person. Oh, I know. I know it is for, for a lot of people. That's, that's yeah. the problem. And even Dan, I think even Dan talks about it in, you know, that he was not comfortable at first being the guy, you know, even when he got his, they started doing the images of him on the bull and the caricatures yeah. of him on the bull. He was just, not crazy about that. He wasn't super comfortable, uh, you know, comfortable about that, but he realized yeah. it works, you know, <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's the main thing. It, it's like, regardless of whether it, you know, you're comfortable or not com- comfortable with it or not, it works. Yeah. When sales go up 20 or 30%, you're like, Oh, right. maybe I can get yeah. into this. <laughs> exactly. So here's something, here's another thing on related to a psycho that I found this interesting. Um, he hired nurses to stay outside of the theater to help those who experienced a heart attack. <laughs> if they had a heart attack. I mean, I was like, I doubt anybody had a heart attack from watching Psycho. But just but the, just the, the theater of that. Yes, exactly. Is <laughs> so good. I had never knew that. That is awesome. Yes. So in like, real I mean, nurses having, too, these weren't like act, having you know, an EMT, like parked out front at the Regal theater there in Turkey Creek, you know, in exactly. Knoxville right. for the, the latest screening of whatever movie, like, sure. Oh, yeah. that's so good. Yeah, it's, it does. I mean, it creates that effect. I mean, people, you know, people want there, it's that curiosity effect. People want to know, you know, especially when it comes to horror, that genre, people want to be scared. Right. I mean, yeah. we've done a segment, I think in the past on, you know, why, you know, horror is so effective or why people are, you know, gravitate to horror films. Cause they like, yeah. they love to be scared. I got an adrenaline rush. Yeah, exactly. Imagine um, if you went on to buy tickets. You could do this so easy now, you know? If you went on to buy tickets, you know, a lot of times you select your seat now in advance, all this stuff, so you almost have to buy them online. Or, yep. But if there was, right after you picked your seats, the a pop-up, there was like a disclaimer pop-up that says, you know, warning, this, this movie, you know, could cause blah, 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 seizures, heart attacks. <laughs> whatever do you <laughs> yeah sign here to waive your rights to a lawsuit or something like that that would be so fun and that oh, would yeah. be i mean it would only work for you know a couple movies and then it wouldn't work anymore but it would be cool to see somebody pull that back out for for at least the launch of a oh, big yeah. thriller type, type movie yeah that's brilliant though what else do you do i'm i'm loving this man this is a great show keep going yeah so i have he, no idea what's about thing. to happen next <laughs> when you enter the theater, you weren't allowed to leave if you were, and if you were five minutes, so he did once you came in, you weren't allowed to go outside. And if wow. you, uh, if you arrived five minutes late, you were not allowed in the theater. Oh, now I'm all about that. Like <laughs> I do not like people getting the theater late. That is yeah. a pet peeve of mine. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, we're well, there twenty. I mean, we're there twenty minutes early every time. So yeah, and I'm the same way. I hate because you feel like you miss. Now nowadays, if you get if you get in five minutes late, you don't miss. You may miss like maybe the first commercial, previews. the first yeah. preview. So which you've seen probably a million times if you've gone to any other. But I theater. enjoy that part of the movie experience. <laughs> I enjoy the full size trailers and. Oh, I do too. But after you've seen like, you know, after you've seen most of them, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like. Of course, okay. now we only go to movies with the, with the dinner. You know, the like the cine cine bar type movies. Yes. Like, like if we're gonna go out. We're gonna make it a thing. So we do the, the movie with dinner. So we're always getting there early so we can get our order in. Right. Too. Right. Otherwise, you're eating in the dark. You can't tell what you're eating. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I know. I know. We uh, we did the Cinnabar thing a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was kind of weird because, you know, it, it is, you know, once you get your food, it's in the dark. So you're trying to make sure that you've got like the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're sitting right next to, and I haven't been to Cinnabar in a while. And I guess that's why it felt weird because the last time I went with family and I was kind of in the middle yeah. with a bunch of people. This last time we went, I think we, it was a couple of weeks ago, we did Elvis and up on the outside sitting next to somebody, I don't know, eating. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just not, I mean, it's kind of weird, you know, yeah. it's like someone you don't need, you know, you don't know. And you're right up close to them eating food that you're not yeah. sure if it's the right thing you ordered, but yeah. hey. breaking bread with a stranger. Yeah. I know. I know. It's crazy. But you just got your, your comfort zone a little. <clears throat> Right, Here's the, I want to show this. I'm going to share this on the screen here. Uh, let's see. Share screen tab. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Here it is. You see that? That's one of the. Uh, oh, yeah. That's one of the posters. No one, <laughs> but no one will be admitted to the theater after the start of each performance. So. Um, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. So it was kind of like, I go back to the, you know, we go back to the um, uh, the principles of persuasion and we talk yeah. about scarcity. You know, you can't, you know, if you get in, it's kind of like that takeaway selling too. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't have it. If you're getting late, too bad. You're, you're not going to be able to get in. So I love that. I wish they would I always, that. I wish they would do that today. Like if you don't get there in time to, for the start of the movie, you you don't get in. Yep. You can wait for the next one. Planes don't well, wait for you. Why should movies wait? That's right. That's right. I mean, I mean, if there's a published start time. So like if you're not in your seat ready to take off, then the captain closes the doors. Sorry. Too but. late. <laughs> <laughs> so I find this interesting. He also bought the rights to the novel because it was written. Psycho was written before he it was turned into a movie. It was a novel. He bought the rights of it and then bought up all of the copies of the book or as many as he could, you know, to get off the mark. You know, he tried to get them out. You know, you couldn't you couldn't buy them. So you wouldn't know what was going to happen in the movie. So he didn't want anyone to know what was going to happen in the book because it was just the movie was based off of completely off the, uh, the book yeah. itself. So he tried to get all of the books out of the marketplace uh, so people wouldn't read it before, you know, before going to the movie. That is commitment. <laughs> I mean, but I guess if you're, if you're doing a, you know, multi-million dollar. It'd be hard to do that today. Film budget. Like, yeah, you, yeah. You're not going to get Amazon to sell everything they got. <laughs> that's for sure. So it'd be a little tougher, <clears throat> but, but yeah, that's, that's smart though. I like that. I love the ideas though, from the two takeaways for me. It's just the intentional creating, like creating the manual, like you're priming people right from the start yeah. before they even watch the movie, that this thing is seriously scary and it yeah. could lead to some health issues. Um, you know, and I think, you know, today people might, you might today get people to sign a waiver, you know, cause I mean, yeah. obviously, you know, from liability issues, you know, like for those purposes alone, but I think companies that do that, I think about people that, you know, make people kind of sign or read things beforehand. And then just the stage of having those nurses, you know, right outside. Yeah, that's, uh, that's just a whole creates nother. that 
whole nother level. Like it's one thing to read a disclaimer, <laughs> yeah. but then to see that they went through the trouble of paying nurses to be honest. Paying nurses. That's like, Real nurses. maybe they're yeah. serious about this. Cause yeah. well, it reminds me too. I wonder if that's where the idea, you know, when you get on a roller coaster, there's always that sign that says, if you have mm-hmm. heart conditions, pregnancy, blah, 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 blah. Don't, don't ride this ride. Yep. I wonder exactly. if that's real or if that's came from more of that positioning to make the ride feel scarier. Oh, it could be. Yeah. Huh. It Never could be priming. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I wonder how many different ways there are. We could, you know, we could use that. Um, I, I've seen situations where, was it on order forms or something like that, where you had to mm-hmm. check that you wanted to decline and there was like a, a, I mean, they tried to do that with click shaming for a while, you know, what they called click shaming, you know, when you, a window would pop up and you're like, no, I don't want to save money on my car insurance. Yeah, I know. Right. Which actually didn't work. It actually hurt. Response. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause it sounded silly. I mean, it, I mean, it, it was kind of insulting. In some yeah. Ways. It was over the top in the yeah. wrong way. Um, but I have seen some like order forms where you would check a box, like I understand mm-hmm. I'm passing on this offer and future prices will be, you know. 30% higher, blah, 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 blah. So I think there are some ways to different, use those kind of things, but yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I like that. Yeah. Yep. All right. It was gr- great marketer. Last thing I will leave you and then we'll get into uh, some of your, some of the advertorials cause I want to mm-hmm. hear these. Um, but it's a, it's a, this is a great takeaway. So, um, when uh, this is this is a takeaway, and I actually read this. It's funny that uh, Ben Subtle. Um, if you don't get his emails, they're just incredible. Um, but he mentioned this comes from a, a book called Backstory, and it's they have several volumes. But this is in depth interviews with some of uh, uh, Hollywood's golden age screenwriters, and they talk about. Uh, the psychology behind their scripts, the business and politics behind the scenes of some of the great movies that were out there. Mm-hmm. So one of them was directly related to, you know, Alfred Hitchcock. And he tells a story in there where uh, I think it says, uh, let's see, I'm reading the the story here. Uh, an interview with screenwriter Richard Maybaum. I don't know uh, where he dropped a zinger about the conversation with Alfred Hitchcock. He said, Hitchcock said to me, uh, did you read what we've got? And I said, yes. And he said, what did you think about it? And he replied, it's not very logical. And then Hitchcock grimaced and said, oh, dear boy, don't be dull. I'm not (laughs) interested in logic. I'm interested in effect. If the audience ever thinks about logic, it's on their way home after the show. And by that time, you see, they've already paid for their tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so something to think about, you know, well, logic you know, is not what you're going for. It's for the, it's for effect. Right. One of the things in all great storytelling is suspension of disbelief, right? Yep, exactly. Like if the, if the story and the effect in those words are good, like even if it's not logical, like, like you're cool with it, right? I mean, it's like... Right. No, this, this feels right. That'd be cool. I know that's, but he's right. If you ever, if you ever even start having that conversation in your head, then the movie's not doing its job. No. Like you should be so caught up in it. Right. That you don't realize it until, you know. Well, it's, yeah. It's, and, and no one wants to be, I mean, the, the whole purpose of people going to a movie is kind of an escape from. Exactly. The logical realm of this yeah. world, you know, the everyday mundane. And so we like the suspension of disbelief for, for a bit of time. I think that, yeah. you know, I think of, you know, Stephen King, a number of his books make no sense from a logical standpoint, you know, but yeah, his job is to suspend disbelief. Well, I mean, the, some of the biggest, belief. I mean, yeah. most of the biggest movies don't make sense logically. Right. I mean, no, exactly. I mean, the Hobbit, the, I mean, Lord of the Rings, yeah, yeah. you know, Chronicles of Narnia, like, yeah, there's nothing that makes sense about any of those movies. Right. Um, yeah. By the way, speaking of movies, did you see that there's going to, there's a Predator que- prequel coming out on Hulu? A pre- oh, yes. I've seen that. Yeah. It's called Prey, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's basically the Predator 
prequels when the yeah, first it time takes place back in like the seven yeah on the uh like an indian yeah like, like in, it's probably in peru or somewhere south america or something yeah. like that but yeah it's like exactly. a couple hundred years ago or something the yeah. first time they came to earth to hunt yep. i was like yeah. that's a cool it is a cool story like i, I want to see that and i don't subscribe yeah. to hulu so i may have to just like well we do sign and so up it's, and sign up i've seen it. it's available <laughs> It's available and it, yeah, I've seen the, uh, the preview looks really interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, we talk about nostalgia all the time, like pulling into those, mm -hmm. those winning formulas. Mm -hmm. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they pull that off. I may have to check that out. Yep. All right. Well, let's talk, um, advertorials. Yeah. I want to hear this. So just a quick review on what an advertorial is. It's an ad that looks either like an editorial or, um, a story, an article mm -hmm. yep. in a newspaper, magazine, website, blog, anything like that. So right now you obviously are trying to make them look a lot like a blog post sure, and less like a sales page. Right. So, um, the one I'm about to show is from a, a company that does e-com type stuff, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. they're, they're in the coffee business and it's a subscription coffee company. So normally you would, you know, You'd click on the link and you'd go to a e-com type landing page yeah. and it'd be like, here's the coffee, blah, 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 blah. Right. Right. But what they've been doing and they found six and they do all of that. I mean, they do that where they have a landing page where you can just order, but one right. of their best performing, um, funnels, sales funnels goes through this advertorial and the advertorial um, so the ad is about, um, you know, grocery store coffee mm -hmm. and the ad uses the same picture. So it's nice and congruent when you get to, the, when you click from the Facebook ad to this, you, you kind of end up here. Yeah. Um, it says before you buy grocery store coffee, read this. So it's a very clickbaity, mm -hmm. you know, if you remember bottom line publications, it's, it's sure. kind of got those, that type of, you know, mm -hmm. headline to it. Um, if you buy coffee from a big name grocery store, then you may not be aware of some pretty scary facts. And then it just goes into more of a story, very casual. I, I like to think of these almost like a medium type post yeah. that you would read on medium. Mm -hmm. It's got a little personality to it. It's got, um, comes across very casual and you're not exactly sure what the yeah. angle is. Right. Um, right. Yeah. When I first look at this, it has it doesn't look like an ad at all. Yeah. I mean, you see this little banner up here, which, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they've tested it with and without that, mm -hmm. but I would be, I'd be interested in testing it without that as well. Sure. Right. So that it feels a little more authentic. Um, so yeah, so how do, how I get, so he talks about, look, I love coffee. I, you know, if I don't have it by 9am, it's going to be a rough day. Then he talks about, you know, I grabbed the red tin or the green bag. So kind of throw in a couple major brands under the bus. Right. Two scoops of the machine, drink, wince, add sugar and milk. Two scoops of the machine, drink, wince, add sugar, milk, repeat. Um, and he talks about the truth about big coffee, which is a phrase that just continues to work. The truth about whatever big, industry yeah, you don't big like. pharma, big coffee, big yeah. ag, you know, yeah. you name it. You could also say, you know, the, the grocery store coffee hoax. You could say yeah, yeah. there's yep. those key couple key phrases like that. The death of big coffee, mm -hmm. um, all in that same idea. Right. Um, and he just goes and he basically says, look, the reason gro grocery store coffee is not good is because it sits on, it goes from a warehouse to a warehouse to sit sure. on a shelf. Right. And by the time it's all said and done, it could be three to six months. And that's basically right. what it says and why it's so bad. And then he says, but then I found out about this Atlas coffee club and <laughs> it's real world coffee and it comes from right. the top 1% of farms and they, they, um, roast it and ship it the same day. Yeah. Directly to your door. So, you know, you're talking five days instead of five months. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can try your first bag and it goes, then wow. it goes basically to the sales page. Um, and kind of picks up on that and you get to select your brew method and then you select oh, wow. your grind type. And That's then you, interesting. um, and eight, and then each month they send you a different bag from a different company. I mean, a different mm. country around the okay. world, 50 different countries. Right. right. And with it, it's kind of like when we did the, um, craft beer club. Oh they yeah. Send you, yeah. They send you a little thing about the coffee, the tasting yes. notes, where it came right. from, about the farm, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but yeah, the main thing is like using that, that story lead in on an mm-hmm. advertorial. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I was working with a company this week and <clears throat> I was able to write two of these and it was a lot of fun. I was like, mm-hmm. it's kind of fun putting on a little bit more of a creative bent and kind of coming up with a scene. Cause in this, in the, in the examples I wrote, I had to kind of, their ideal customers, like a 30 year old married sure. woman with kids. Right. So that's not me, but you know, so I had to kind of go into that kind of mindset and that language and everything. And, and, uh, it was kind of fun to do something a little bit different like that mm-hmm. and not such a hard sell, but more of a interesting story mm-hmm. with a little humor and little things like that in it. So, um, I think people could use these a lot more, especially in, did you, did you use, um, did you kind of take this headline? Uh, and use it. No, I came up with some, okay. some of my own that were just more, okay. I did go through, um, swiped.co mm-hmm. and spent probably an hour just looking at different headlines and just trying to get some ideas. So before I wrote the advertorial, I, I ended up with like 22 headlines, mm. um, and then picked two that we could test. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was, it was fun. So I, I used some old school stuff and I, and then kind of, you know, went from there and, um, ended up pulling a quote out of the story that I'd written Uh and use that as the headline. Nice. So yeah, it was, it was kind of, and I can't, like I said, I can't reveal the headline just yet. Once it, yeah, if it does well and once it's published, um, I'll get permission and bring it back around. But, um, you know, who knows it may bomb too. So we, we don't know yet. So (laughs) (laughs) that's the joy of copy. You don't know until it's out there. Yeah. No. So, oh man, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and kind of in that same vein of storytelling and things like yeah. that. Um, I was looking at this book we haven't talked about in a while. Oh, uh, tested yeah. advertising methods with, by John Caples. Mm-hmm. Um, Ben actually kind of brought it up on our call this week that, um, he was like, yeah, man, I've been going back through this. And I was like, oh yeah, I need to go back through that too. So I pulled it back out and Mm -hmm. the section I was looking at that kind of relates to this is there's a section there called 25 titles and opening sentences, sentences for today. And it's basically a lot of titles and opening sentences Mm -hmm. from Reader's Digest back in the day. Okay. Because Reader's Digest was really good at like, they would take a longer story. Great headline. Yeah. And they would abridge it and break it Mm -hmm. down into kind of this you know, the, the main part of the story and they would come up with their mm-hmm. own headline and their own opening sentence. Oh yeah. So I was just going back through these and I was like, um, these would not necessarily work for a sales letter, mm-hmm. but for an advertorial, they would work really, really well. Sure. Yeah. Um, like here's one that says the recycling myth. One third of us households make a ritual of sorting their garbage for curbside mm-hmm. recycling programs. So, and then that's just the opening line, but then you would go into, you know, but there's a little known fact. Most recyclers don't know, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Um, quotes seem to work really well. Like if you pull a quote out of the story, Mm -hmm. that tends to work really well for a headline. Um, so yeah, there's, it's just. You know, I think, it, it, and maybe I'm just in storytelling mode right now because I did a training um, last week also for uh, capitalism. Yeah. And I was helping people with their econ brands with their pitch decks. And <clears throat> I was talking about how to get a story in that first, you know, 60 seconds of your pitch. Right, right. And so that that's that was on my mind as well. And just how to tell a quick, short story. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, I think we need more of that because I think we've just gotten into a place. I mean, people love storytelling and we've talked oh, about yeah. this hundreds of times. Um, and even like a lot of the reels and the short things you see, they're, they're kind of story-based, you know, and they're, that's what captures people's attention. So the more you can learn to tell stories and again, you have to know when to do it and when not to do it. Like if, if you're down the road in the order process, like story is more for cold generation, cold traffic, Mm -hmm. new people to your world. Right. As they get to know you more, you can use story less and less. 
So that's my thoughts on stories and there's a fantastic, and you may have this book. I don't know if you do or not, but I'm pulling this up because I'm in the middle of reading it right now. It's called the silent, the science of storytelling. It's a nice cover. I like that. Yeah. William Stower. I haven't seen that. Oh man. It is really good. So, um, all right, let me, let me open up my Amazon cart. (laughs) And I think, let's see, I'm trying to think how I stumbled across this book is Joe Vitale had mentioned this as one of his favorite books on story, you know, writing stories. Um, so I think I ordered this a couple of years ago and I never got around to reading it. So uh, a few weeks ago, I just kind of pulled it off the shelf because I'm like, you know what? You know, I haven't read that book in a while. I mean, I've never read that book. So, uh, and it's got an interesting title, but it's awesome. I mean, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty of what really, you know, what really inspires people or what, you know, really gets people going in your stories. Um, Four and a half stars out of 1100 ratings. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of things in here that are really good takeaways. Um, And it, you know, I think about the movies or the TV shows that I've watched. um, And they all have a common theme is that there is someone who is uh, kind of the underdog, so -hmm. to speak. Yeah. And they, they're kind of working against the status quo. Yeah. Um, Let's see. It, it says here, and here's a section that I've underlined here that I thought I guess was pretty important. It says some, it, <clears throat> it's sometimes assumed that we work, that, that we root for characters who are simply kind. This idea is, uh, this is a nice idea, but it's not true in story as in life. Kind people are wonderful and inspiring and oh, so terribly boring. Um, <laughs> uh, It says, besides, if a hero starts out in such a perfect selfless shape, uh, there's going to be no tale to tell. For the story theorist, Professor Bruno uh, Bettelheim, the storyteller's challenge isn't so much one of arousing the reader's moral respect for the protagonist, but their sympathy. In this inquiry into the psychology of fairy tales, he writes that the child identifies with the good hero, not because of his goodness, but because the hero's condition makes a deep positive appeal to him. Um, so I thought that was interesting. I mean, it's, it's all about not having the perfect character, but having a person that maybe is growing along the way. Yeah. That is getting better to some degree, but also has a lot of problems. You know, we've talked about some of these, you know, some of our favorite characters, uh, from a superhero standpoint are the ones that are flaw that are, that have flaws, you know, Peter Parker, the Spider-Man, you know, teenage kids got you know, problems. Yeah. I mean, that idea um, that, that you don't necessarily like the character as much as you have sympathy for them. That's a, yeah, that's exactly. a big, in, that's a, it's a pretty strong insight. Like that's, mm-hmm. Like I, I thought about Fight Club, right? So you've got mm-hmm. two characters who yeah. are the same character, but you know, it's like, sorry for the spoiler if you haven't seen it. Um, if you haven't seen it by now, I'm sorry. It's like, yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you do feel kind of sorry for Edward Norton's character, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can't remember his name. Um, but then for Brad Pitt's character, you're like he's kind of rude and kind of mean and kind of, but, but he's right. kind of cool. Right. Yeah. But you definitely have sympathy more for Edward Norton's character. So yeah, uh, sure do. I can, I can totally see that. Well, in, in two of my favorite TV shows, I'm thinking about them. Uh, like one of my favorite TV shows, Breaking Bad. Mm-hmm. Like, and then the other is Sopranos. So I'm trying to think, okay, what makes me attracted to the characters, you know, in those, well, you've got in one, Breaking Bad, you know, Walter White, who's a, you know, chemistry teacher in high school, he's got cancer and he's trying to, you know, he's trying to provide for his family, you know, granted he does get, I mean, he does start 
selling meth, you know, yeah. you know, to do that. But you get it. Up, you get yeah. it though, right? But you get it. I mean, you can identify with his, yeah. you know, where he's at. A guy that is, you know, down and out. He's making, you know, probably what, 50,000 a year as a teacher. Yeah. He's got cancer. He's probably going to die and he has nothing to leave to his family. And, you know, his son has disability problems and, you know, there's so many things on top of that, that you just feel for him as a person. And then you're thinking, okay, well, you know, he's trying to take care of his family. And then, yeah. but lo and behold, as you know, that, you know, that progresses, that story progresses to the end, he becomes, you know, a that gum drug king <laughs> in the process. And you're like, yeah. whoa, you know, <laughs> How am I rooting for this guy? But you've yeah. already been you've already been sucked then, into the story and with, the character. And that sets up the internal conflict. Yes. Yeah. That you have to keep watching to try to get that resolved for yourself. That's right. Especially yeah. in these longer, you know, series mm -hmm. type things. It's like yeah. Oh my God, how did I how did I end up here? <laughs> I gotta see how this ends because I don't yeah. know how to feel about this. Yeah. It's kinda like we talked about with Cobra Kai, the new Oh yeah. Yeah. New like how Absolutely. it flip flop. You didn't know who you were rooting for. <laughs> <laughs> like you go back and forth every two week. or three seasons in you're like no yeah. daniel's a jerk nope yeah, johnny's yeah. just doesn't have his act together that's right like just went back and forth and like i don't mm. know who to pull for right you know so uh, yeah it's it's very interesting that's that's a good thought about the sympathy thing mm -hmm. um we yeah, really do and i think about some of the some of my favorite books uh all time are Ones where the character is up against, you know, they're kind of up against the, um, you know, they're kind of the underdog. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of my all time favorite movies, Cinderella Man, uh, you know, with Russell Crowe. Love mm -hmm. that movie. Yeah. But takes place during the uh, Depression. It's based off a true story, actually, a boxer. And, um, you know, he's down and out. He's at the top of his game and then gets injured and then, the depression comes and he's down and out has no, you know, he has didn't have two nickels to rub together. Uh, well, it's kind of like the a, Rocky movies, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nobody really what most people didn't have not to this day, probably seen the first Rocky movie. Right. When it really took off was when he went from champ and then losing. <clears throat> yeah. Like Rocky three. Yeah. You know, when he started, you know, getting out of control and mm -hmm. stopped working out. Like that's when I think right. a lot of people really started watching the, you know, three, four, and then exactly. ultimately five. But, right. um, cause you know, Rocky was a great movie, but it mm -hmm. wasn't, I don't know. There's something about three and four that was just a different level of like, Oh, they were, they were like know, the best. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's interesting about the, rising and then falling back and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff too. There's a, you know, the great courses catalogs that you used to get in the mail. Oh yeah. Yeah. And now they're, they used to be like $300 per course. Now they're like $19, mm -hmm. right. um, which is great. Cause now you can get them on audible. I don't know if yep, you knew that. Exactly. Yeah. You can there's, find them. There's one on there about storytelling and it's a professor doing a storytelling class and it is so good. Ooh. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's a, she's actually teaches at Kennesaw state. Really? In, yeah. Just outside of Atlanta. Okay. Um, and she goes into like what makes a story and she does a lot of storytelling in the class. And I was like, man, why didn't I have teachers like that when I was in school? Yeah. I would have stayed in school. Well, probably not, but <laughs> it's a fantasy. Um, I'm writing this down cause I want to listen to it. I, I got I'll see if I can find right? it and, and send yeah, it to send you. Send me but, a link. Yeah. Um, it was really good and just very entertaining on a drive and things like that too. So good. Yeah. We'll have to dive a little bit deeper. So, um, yeah. So the next well, week let's talk a little bit about, um, the Savannah, Savannah bananas. Savannah. Minor, bananas. It's a minor league baseball team that is doing some cool stuff. Mm. Oh, and that brings to mind, we should also talk about, I don't know if you watched any of the field of dreams. Uh, there was a baseball game last night out in the court, you know, they've actually designed or they've made a cornfield out in the same place where they filmed Field of Dreams, you know, at, you know, in a cornfield in Iowa. Yeah. And they played a, a game last night. It was the Reds and the, uh, 
was the Reds. The Red they Sox. did that last year, though, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They do in. one a year. So yeah. very nostalgic. Yeah. Um, and you know the 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 top seats on this venue go for about eight eight grand. You know, so wow. <laughs> it's like you know, but they're I mean the most they can hold. I think there's like uh, six, maybe six thousand seats, something yeah. like that. But Wow. Anyway, something, I mean, that's interesting because I was just, I caught a snippet. I'm not a huge fan, but I wanted just to see the, uh, you know, just what it looked like and, you know, them having a major professional baseball event and it look and it's literally out in the cornfield. I mean, you look, you look at the outfield and it's just, you corn. Know, there's corn. <laughs> so it's too bad. It just looks like they're playing out in the country. Har yeah. Too bad. Harvest is a little too soon you could do a crossover between like children yeah. of the corn and <laughs> major league baseball <laughs> at halloween yeah, well yeah i guess you could That's bump a, that up children of the corn that was stephen king right i'm not sure that who that was but i, I remember seeing it freaked me. i've watched parts that of it. was I don't think yeah ever, that was freaky yeah yeah that scared the crap out of me because we had a cornfield on our property it wasn't very yeah. big but it was big enough that if you went in there that scared the hell out of you and you were you know, yeah. five feet tall. Like <laughs> I was in like junior high whenever we had that. Yeah. I was like in the corn, six yeah. feet tall. It's like, it's creepy. <laughs> like yeah. I don't, it's just, I'm pretty sure that's Stephen King. Uh, yeah. one of his short stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That'd be a good crossover. Yeah. Just have people like coming out and grabbing the baseball players, and <laughs> dragging them into the corn. That boost ratings. Big time. Yeah. You got like, People, you know, people all staged, kind of like the Alfred Hitchcock, you know. Yeah. Out in the, uh, out in the that or we could do, we could do a Twister instead too. We could do Twister. Oh yeah. Have a, have a tornado come. That's another great right one. To yeah. the field. <laughs> all these CGI crossover, that one probably. <laughs> yeah. All these crossover events. So cross marketing opportunities. All right, man. Well, I'll let you wrap it up. Looks like I got Good another stuff. book to buy now. So uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Again, the science of storytelling. It is fantastic. Yeah, that, look, that looks good. Great, great read. Um, but yeah, to all of our listeners, uh, we'll check you next week. Um, you can find us at persuasionbythepint.com. You can find us on all of your platforms, Stitcher Radio, iHeart, Spotify. Um, you know, um, oh, our Facebook group. Yeah. You know, Facebook.com forward slash persuasion by the pint. I had a brain freeze there because I was trying to think. Um, <laughs> One of the guys that we've had on our show this week actually gave us a little shout out. Um, the story sales machine. What was it? Yeah. Bill, Bill Mueller. Bill, yeah. He gave us a, a huge shout out. So I saw that one. I still subscribe to his emails and I see that uh, he actually mentioned you, Sean. He did. Uh, Cause I, I go back and emails. forth every once in a while. When I see an email I like, I just kind of throw my two cents in and yeah. Um, he's got another course coming out. Maybe we can get him back on the show and. Oh, Perfect. Let him, let him pitch his new thing, but um, he's got oh. some. Yeah, he does a good job with his emails. They're really he does. He's good. Very good writer. Yep. So, all right, guys. Well, we'll see you next time again. Persuasion by the pint dot com. And uh, Sean has been fun. We'll do a couple of episodes next week. I think we've got a guest lined up, and then we'll cover some of the stuff that we've been talking about. Um, that we'll follow up on on a separate. Uh, you know, a little flight okay. of persuasion there at the end. Yeah. So. Sounds good. Have a great weekend. See we'll ya. see you next time. Yep. All right.